Hello, everyone, and welcome to a, uh, another edition of the SEA Coaches Corner presents Heroes and Traditions, and we're extremely excited to be able to bring you some of the backstory and history of the Mid-Realm or the Middle Kingdom, and we have some outstanding guests. But first, I would very much like to introduce my co-host uh, on these um, these adventures, uh, His Grace Brennan, three-time King of the East, uh, March Madness junkie. Let's give it up for Duke Brennan. Thanks, Ahilanad. I'm super excited to be here and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Well, let's get our guest introduced. You're up first, Brennan. Uh, I am very excited to introduce uh, Duke Talamar Gan E. Lewin, and I hope I didn't butcher that. Uh, the 21st, 26th, and 35th King of the Middle Kingdom, and the 8th Duke of the Mid-Realm. Thanks for joining us, Your Grace. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. And I'd like to introduce uh, a man who's no stranger to our streams. He's normally a host and a coach, uh, but let's welcome back His Grace Duke Eliyahu, who has served as the 29th and the 36th King of the Mid-Realm. Your Grace, thanks for joining us, especially in this capacity. This is really exciting for us. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me. And we are also uh, extremely honored to be joined by His Grace Dog Thorgrimson, the 42nd, 47th, 58th, 61st, 75th, 80th, <laughs> and oh my gosh, 86th Sovereign of the Mid-Realm. Thank you for joining us, Your Grace. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I'm I'm honored to be included. A, a glutton for punishment, I think. Well, you know, I I like being king. I, what can I say? It's once once you've learned how to do the job and you figure out how to streamline the work and and not make it a horrible burden. It's not so bad being king. <laughs> Well, I can't throw too many rocks from my glass house with my six wins, so I, I know how much fun it is to be crowned, and, uh, and I definitely appreciate your perspective on it. So, guys, uh, let's do the way back sort of sound effect and go back to these early, early days of the SCA. So, out west, um, they had their big party and, uh, you know, started the SCA as we know it and it moved east and you know somewhere around that same same time period it was starting to form in the east uh, i think people were starting to uh um you know it had brought back into what would eventually become the mid realm but in the chicago area anyone have any uh details about those fuzzy memories back then well it was it was somewhat before i joined but i heard stories of it and i heard of the the spread of the sca through um science fiction conventions and um the first king of the middle was duke eventually duke carry doc of the bow um <clears throat> and it was the first official group was in chicago the chicago area i think but there was about the same time, another group started in the Lansing area, and the two groups have always disagreed about which was the first group, which started first, which was officially recognized first, and so on. Um, so, um, <clears throat> but there was um, the the Middle Kingdom quickly expanded from Chicago through Michigan into Ohio, and eventually encompassed an enormous geographic area um, all the way from southeastern Ohio, southwestern Illinois, the eastern, most eastern part of Ontario, and all the way to Calgary. Um, so it was, it, it was literally 24 hours of driving time if you were driving from one end of the kingdom to the other. I'll throw in a couple other things. Um, my wife and I just stepped down last weekend as the Baron and Baroness of Middle Marches, which was one of the early, early Barons, Baronies of the kingdom and encompassed the entire state of Ohio. 
And there's an interesting story, you know, Eli mentioned Northwoods, which was uh, Lansing, Michigan. Um, supposedly we actually were, became a barony before them at that early. And um, what happened was that nobody knew where all the lines were at that moment in time of, of kingdoms. And Northwoods applied to the kingdom of the East to become a barony and the, um, then to become Baron Jahan applied directly to the uh, Middle Kingdom to become a barony. Um, and uh, so uh, there's some confusion and I've, I've heard it from the horse's mouth, so to speak, Count Jahan. Um, and uh, they got the order of precedence because they decided that they would have a, you know, a, a friendly fight over it in the winter, we'd get to have the order of precedence being the first in line. Um, but my first experience with the SCA was in 1971. Uh, the kingdom was very young still, and um, uh, there was an event at a high university in Athens, Ohio, that a friend of mine went to. And it was very much Tolkien-esque. Lots of elves, lots of dwarves, you know, the Shire. Um, and that was what a lot of, at least this part of Ohio that I live in, centered around you know that type of uh, um, philosophy and that's what pulled lots and lots of college students in in those early 1970s uh, into the SCA. So uh, when you uh, you got your start when uh, Telmar? Well I found out about the SCA in 71 when that first event in my local group happened, but I personally did not get involved until four years later. In 71, I was going to grad school, getting married, just got commissioned a second lieutenant in the reserves, waiting to go <laughs> to Vietnam. Too many things going on. By 75, four years later, life had settled down and I had a job and I, I was ready to you know, jump in with both feet to the SCA but not as a fighter, interestingly enough, not as a fighter. So what, uh, what pulled you in if not the fighting? Um, those were the days of Freon helmets, the throwaway Freon helmets. And when the guys said, hey, you know, you wanna be a fighter, you know, I got, and they showed me rattan, which was basically clubs with two before cross quillins. And the, the Freon helmets were just beat to crap in the top of the helmet. That's where we, we hit in those days, top of the head. And after every practice, you'd you know take the padding out and beat the top of it out <laughs> again to get the dents out. So it's like, no, nah, I don't really think I want to do this. Uh, uh, what else can you? What else can you do? Well, you can, you know, you can do things and become a pelican. You can do things and become a laurel. So well, yeah, maybe I'll do some things like that. And I went to my first real event, which was the Christmas tourney in '75. Um, I joined right after, a couple of weeks after Penzig Four. And um, as I walked into that event, and it was being um, overseen by the Queen uh, Zarina, because Michael of Boershaven had supposedly um, abdicated and, and moved to England. Um, I was fortunate enough to walk in when two quality fighters were fighting, Sir Polidor and Sir Merriwal. As I walked through the door and watched them fight, it struck me that there is an art to this. There is a skill to this. These guys are not clubbing each other. They're having fun. And my attitude instantly changed by watching that fight. And the next day I had my first fight to practice. That kind of goes from there. <laughs> Thank you, that's awesome. Uh, Your Grace Eliyahu, can you tell us how you got started with the SCA? Glad to. Um, uh, and my dad passed away when I was a senior in college, an undergraduate. And so I moved back to South Bend um, uh, to help my mother. And um, while I was there, living in South Bend, I went to, I found a, a fantasy and science fiction bookstore called The Griffin. And I was in there and struck up a conversation uh, with someone who invited me to participate in a weekly D&D &D game in the back of the store. 
And uh, every couple of months we'd go over to her house and the group of us and we'd game there. Well, she was in the SCA and she started telling me about it. And I said, oh, well, this sounds interesting. Um, uh, so I went to my, I started going to, they started an SCA chapter and I started going to meetings. That was the beginning of 1978. And I went to uh, my first event in May of 1978. And that was the first coronation of Moonwolf, Moonwolf Star Catterson. Um, <clears throat> I had also, I had been a, a competitive fencer and had no interest in uh, people, the fighting, which was mostly people clubbing themselves. Um, and then I saw Moonwolf fighting and he had a control and an elegance um, and was dominant on the field at the time. And I, I thought, well, maybe I'll give it a try. But I went to my first event, first couple of events with a sketch pad because I'd been an art student and I did drawings and paintings of people. Um, I was in my studio, I still paint. And, um, <clears throat> but eventually um, I tried fighting um, which in those days was, we'll put you in armor and hit you until you figure out how not to get hit. Um, and <clears throat> for some reason, I actually liked it because um, I still could move. Um, a lot of people weren't moving, but I had been trained as a fencer, so I was moving um, and I liked it and um, found that, um, yeah, I. I enjoyed it. Oh, and by the way, the person who introduced me to the SCA uh, it was Mercedes Lackey, who's become a very well-known uh, fantasy author. So that's how I found the SCA. Eventually, I moved for work. I moved to uh, Michigan, to Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, and was part of the uh, new group there. Um, <clears throat> in fact, it was one of three people in a meeting where we figured out what the name of the group Cinnabar was going to be. Um, I was the first Knights Marshal of the group because I was the only authorized fighter there. And um, <clears throat> me and my, my carpet armor and um, 20 pound coat of plates and uh, scrounged materials that I'd put together into armor. But I ended up teaching and training everybody there. Um, with my limited knowledge so that's amazing so. especially the fact that famous person drug you kicking and screaming into the sca well introduced <laughs> me to it i wasn't screaming so much but uh, i was kind of i was in, definitely intrigued and now you ad lib the way you want to and i'll ad lib the way i oh, want okay to. sounds good <laughs> now that's really neat uh, and then let's follow up with, uh, with Dog. Uh, when did you start? And tell us a little bit about your early days. Well, um, my start is, is pretty clear in that uh, I was going with my college roommate. I was a freshman in college. And I was going to see the premiere of Excalibur in the theater, 1981. And... Um, you know, we showed up at this theater and uh, we get our ticket and we go in and in the lobby, there's this guy in honest to God chain mail. I mean, like real, not the macrame stuff from the movies, but like real chain mail. Of course, in 1981, re real chain mail meant, you know, butted fence wire, you know, <laughs> but but it was, it was all real to me. And I'm like, this is what my D and D character wears. This is awesome. And I got to touch it. And, and, you know, uh, and, uh, I talked to him and I was, I was fascinated by this and he started to, Oh, well, I'm, I'm a member of the SCA. And we had this whole thing. And that was, um, uh, used to be Baron Durr of hidden mountain. Now he goes by Mukhtar Dur al Jabal. He's been around forever and ever, um, still at Penzig every year. But uh, so I, he and I talked for like 15 minutes and then the movie was starting. So I'm like, OK, I'm going to go see this movie and then I'll be back. And that's what I did. I went in with saw a movie. I came out and I talked to him some more. Um, 
I invited him over to my apartment to tell me more about this and show me some of his gear. He came out the next day. Um, he put a old, it, it was not a Freon can. It, we, he had progressed beyond, it was a, it was a scratch built Spang and Helm in the old Polydor pattern. There's that name again, but it like was like eight inches taller than my head. And I, and it was all full of uh, open cell foam. So I had to like squish it down on my head and he hit me and uh, I, you know, okay, that was, that has never happened to me before. That was interesting. And he said, now it rang a little bit, but, it, but it doesn't hurt. I want you to think about how you feel right now. And, and there's no pain. Am I right? And he went, I went, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you that. He says, okay, well, if you, if you can put up with that, you can, you can do this. And I said, well, well, I get, how long before I get to hit back? And he, he says, oh, oh, right away. Says, oh, well, I'm in. <laughs> so um, uh, that was in 1981. We, I don't know, probably a month later, we went to our first event. Uh, well, I went to my first event. He, he had been in the SCA for several years um, in uh, what's now Athelmark, I believe. Um, so we went to an event in Lansing in Northwoods as, as was mentioned there and it was in, um, in a field house. And this is a very formative moment. And like others, I saw there was a, there was a tournament happening at the far end. There was only like 30 fighters there. And one end of this sort of dry ice rink, they'd cordoned off and there were guys sitting around and getting their armor ready and, and so on. But Durr looks at me and he nudges me and he says, look at all those guys and tell me which one of them is king. And so I'm scanning the crowd. I'm looking for a crown. No, no crowns in evidence. But there was one guy whose stuff, he's wearing chainmail shirt and like his arms and legs all matched. And they looked like real steel and leather. And, and he, he had the whole outfit and he had the look. And more important, he, it was the way he moved through the crowd and how people moved around him. I said, that guy right there. And he said, you're right. And that was Duke Laurel and Darksbane. Um, and that, that colored my forever, my view of what a king in the SCA should be. Um, and uh, I think I authorized three months after that, that incident in the parking lot. And um, that's, that's, I've been in it since then. Thank you so much for sharing that. I never tire of hearing from people uh, share their first experiences in the SCA, whether it's someone who joined in the 60s, the late 60s, or someone from a 70s, from any era. And, you know, it's not been that long ago. I heard someone who joined just a couple of years ago talking about it. And I still get very excited to hear about someone's first days in the SCA. And, and so it is a pleasure, though, to hear from each of you about your early days. So uh, one of the purposes and goals of the of the of this stream is to explore the history of uh, of a kingdom through the prism of armored combat. Um, and you know so we're definitely going to look at reigns um, you know and who stood out in prowess and the various training methods that were going on and and I realized that early on in, in the SCA training was very um, uh, very interesting to say the least uh, um, and it has continued over time to start to resemble something that looks an awful lot like a, a combat sport uh, and a martial art uh, but I don't I don't think it started that way anywhere so um, you know, we definitely want to um, we definitely want to to you know look at all those different things so let's take a look real quick at um, the dukes that were created uh, during the first decade. And I'm going to lump in that last year, 69, um, with the rest of the 70s. So the first Duke made in the mid realm was uh, Cradock. And then there was Andrew of Seldom Rest. And uh, is it Doggin or Dagon? Anyone? It's Doggin. 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 Okay. And then uh, Finnevar, who had won. Uh, I, I believe that his first reign in the East and then won his ducal 
uh, reign in the middle during this period. And then Merowald uh, was the uh, other Duke made uh, during the, the, the period of 1969 through the seventies. So if anyone has any um, thoughts or recollections about any of those fighters that they would like to share, uh, we would be very interested to hear kind of uh, uh, about these fighters or anyone else that stands out from the period. Well, I'll throw in some information about Andrew of Seldom Rest. Um, he was uh, my knight. He was king at Pensick One and at Pensick Two. Interestingly enough, at Pensick One, he fought against Karayadok of the Bow. And at Pensick Two, he fought against Finvar who was in the, in the East at the time. Um, so, um, you know, he had already been king twice and Crydock had moved. So Andrew was, when I joined, the only Duke in the mid-realm. Uh, he lived in Ohio and uh, was the Vicar Baron of Middle Marches of Ohio. Um, and so he seemed like kind of that, that person that, you know, maybe I wanted to square to. And um, during the reign of Dagen, um, and I was active during that time, I had asked Duke Andrew if I could become a square of his. And uh, I didn't get a reply for a couple months. I thought, well, you know, he's going to do anything about it. And uh, I had already become authorized in all the weapon styles and had won two local tournaments before I even asked, you know. So at the Christmas tourney, um, again, down in Kentucky, I was in the finals against uh, Sir John of Altman. And you, you asked you know, the question earlier, who were some of the fighters that never became Dukes that were really, really good? Sir John of Altman was probably the best fighter in the Middle Kingdom. Lots of people you know, said that, but he was a captain uh, and, and the tank corps, the active duty. And he couldn't afford, this is the Cold War, he couldn't afford to become the king. He didn't know where he was going to be six months from then. So Andrew, uh, in the finals, right before the finals, he says, if you can beat John of Altman, I'll make you my square. So we went in and the first two fights, they weren't real long, but they weren't real short either. And he won both fights and he won the tournament. And, you know, it was the best two out of three in the finals. So I asked John, I said, do you mind if we go the third round just for fun of it? And he says, nah, let's go ahead and do that. Yeah, it's been a fun fight. So he says, come out with whatever you want. I'm going to come out with a pole arm. So I came out Florentine and he came up to me, he said, privately, Talamar, go get something else. I'm going to, I'm going to eat your face off with, <laughs> with two swords. I said, no, I've been kind of thinking about this. You know, this is what I'm going to stick with. So in a move that I had imagined in my head, I did kill John of Altman. And I walked up to Andrew at the end of the tournament. I said, did you mean that I had to win the tournament by killing John of Altman to be your squire or just kill him? And the king is sitting there, Doggin, you know, the next, this was his second reign. He looked over at Andrew and he says, did you tell this kid that he had to beat John of Altman to be your squire? Andrew said, well, he took a long puff on the cigarette first. He said, yeah. <laughs> Doggin said, well, I'll take you as a squire right now, kid. He said, no, well, I asked Andrew first. The decision is his. So that's how I became a squire to Duke Andrew um, over several years. And uh, uh, he was a good knight. Taught me a lot of good things. Um, and always remained a good friend with Doggin also. I'd, I'd so, like to just, for people who don't know, Duke Andrew, Andrew of Seldom Rest, was an imposing physical presence. He was a large, very strong. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, and more, yeah. more hit points than anybody else I ever knew. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, the, the first, and, and this is a, a a tangent but the as king the first pelican meeting i had to um oversee had three pelicans in it duke andrew the guy who was the kingdom seneschal and uh duke laurelin and 
three very strong personalities and Andrew and the Seneschal at the time did not like each other. Um, actually came to blows sometime later, which, um, but that just a, a tangent. D Andrew was a very imposing, physically imposing presence. And I saw him at the first event I went to and thought this, yeah, I, I don't think that's fightings for me, but then I saw Moonwolf as I mentioned, so. And I'll put in a little aside too that uh, Andrew asked me to squire once after I'd won a couple of tournaments and I turned him down. So he he had he had a lot of squires. By the time he came to me, he probably had 20, 30 squires scattered around the kingdom. Um, that wasn't the kind of relationship I was looking for. So. So what does training look like at this time? Is it, uh, is it put your armor on and go out and just take your lumps or are folks teaching things? What's, what's the practice look like? There was a transition eventually. I mean, I started, as I mentioned, my first event was May of 78. I didn't authorize until I authorized in 79 because I didn't at first think I wanted to fight. And the fighting training I got was stick you in armor. Here are the rules. We'll hit you until you figure out how not to get hit. Um, but there weren't a lot of fighters in my area. Um, eventually, I squired to um, uh, Sir Galem uh, Wesley. Uh, may he rest in peace. And he taught me that you could win by thinking, by, by analyzing your opponent, what they're going to do, how they're going to do it, and, and choosing your actions to counter that. So in a lot of ways, training at that time, was that was the first I'd ever realized that it wasn't simply people clubbing each other. Um, so that was when I was exposed to, to that. And I remember being at a, a tournament and I was about to go out and fight a fellow who was a big, strong, club you a lot kind of fellow. And Galen said to me, uh, when they say lay on, he's going to charge you. You're going to take two steps back, one step to the right, and then hook your shot under his shield. I said, yes, sir. So they said, lay on. He charged me. I took two steps back, one to the right, threw a shot under his shield, killed him. Um, to everybody's surprise, except Galen, who told me later that Duke Laurelin was standing behind him and Galen was mouthing the instructions as I was doing them. And Laurelin tapped him on the shoulder and said, witchcraft. But, but um, I learned then you could think, and that changed the kind of training I sought as well, because I knew that having, I, I, having studied other forms of physical combat sport, I knew that there was, had to be more to it. And it was, it eventually there was. And back to that time frame of, of, of late 75 into the early 76, I got authorized at the um, coronation of Albert and Selena um, in the spring of, of 76. And so that time period kind of in between, three quarters inch plywood, flat sheet, bicycle tire or um, garden hose around the edges, um, Freon helmet, um, pretty much the same thing that Eli was saying. It's, you know, put your armor on, carpet armor. And uh, there was no gorgets required. Um, the padding for the knees was just a piece of leather with um, some foam behind it. Didn't wrap around the knees, just hung right on the front, basically like a football pad or, an, uh, you know, or 
or I mean, a, a football knee pad or a basketball elbow pad is is all there was. But you know, we didn't have the straight you know Bellatrix snap to the side of the head. People were just basically hitting each other in the top of the helmet. So why did you need a gorget? So um, it was pretty much like Eli said, it was go out, put your armor on and spar. Stop and talk, spar some more, start and talk. Um, my first training when the local group was with um, Ron Up Howe, who later became the first knight of Atlantia. Um, you know, he wasn't particularly good at that moment in time. You know, we were all evenly matched and you know, we did some training, but it was mostly put armor on and spar. I think the first time I had some training was with Laurelin and Aylin. Everybody in Ohio went to all the Ohio events. That's how we took care of each other. And we were about the same level of expertise. When, you know, one of us would develop a shot, killed each other. And then we'd say, okay, how'd you do that? They'd show us how. And then we'd work on how to defeat that. And the next event we got together, you know, we didn't get hit by that same blow. This is what I did, so you couldn't hit me anymore. So we got better like a ladder, step step by step of developing a blow, developing a defense, sharing with each other back and forth and back and forth. And that's, I think one of the most important things of, of my development was learning how to, you know, share, you know, attacks and defenses and, and, and get better. So we have a question from the gallery uh, that I'll ask now from a first time caller, longtime listener, Duke Edmund. He wants to know if uh, uh, who else from this period other than Sir John of Outman um, should we have heard of or, that, you know, that maybe you can you guys can shine a light on and, uh, you know, give us an idea of some folks that we may not have heard of, but we should have. Well, if Telmer will have more, I remember a few names that when just when I started, these guys had mm -hmm. already come up and were being considered in the like 80, 81. Um, uh, the name that a controversial name, but because of his prowess, but other things was uh, Kel Wolf Longstrider. And I don't know the I don't know the politics as much as I just remember the name and I remember fighting him in those early days. But he he became a, a political uh, um, catalyst in the middle that caused a big sort of schism in the the upper echelons of experienced fighters. Well, and not it wasn't to be clear it wasn't his doing. And true, um, if somebody wants to know the story of that, uh, I was not a knight at the time, but I certainly heard stories. And um, but it wasn't his doing. It was. Um, things other people did he was just the focus of but he was certainly well known um i think that um um i'm sorry i'm i'm blanking for a second go ahead talmer i was i was knighted at the time and you're right it wasn't his fault and i'm not sure that i should talk about outside the circle as it were you know the the things that you know led to the um, some of the issues. It had to do basically with come to this event, and we're going to make you a knight. And that didn't happen. You know, a, a promise by a handful of knights as opposed to the whole body. But um, other than that, I don't think we should go into it much farther. Well, we can stay focused on the prowess aspect of things. Uh, is anyone else uh, at that time period sort of a, a local legend or anything that uh, would be interesting to hear about? guys are killing me yeah I, I remember names and i didn't i was trying to stay quiet until the 80s <laughs> <laughs> well jog their memory there then um well uh, thorvald the grim oh well, thorvald no. thorvald the grim who was the first and a longtime baron of northwoods and a knight was um very skilled with a great sword but he um, never won crown tournament for a number of reasons, but he was 
he was well known for his skill with a, a great sword, which was unusual in those days. Somebody who I saw at my first event where I pointed out Laurel and who was Prince at the time was uh, Hugo von Pelsknipe. He was Prince, that, he was Laurelin's Prince that at that event. Von von Feuerklippe. Yeah. Can I, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I, I'm yeah, I'm yeah. Remembering his last but name. he was he he was Prince. He did he did reign once. Uh, yes. Ben's at ten, I think. Um, and he had that. He was a long, lean, tall, whippy kind of. He was a whip, not a club. So. He did the coolest thing with a Dane axe that I've ever seen from that day to this but that's we're not going to get into those kind of fight stories um but it's, but he was a disappointment in meeting in person <laughs> <laughs> nice enough guy but all the all of the personality of a of a wet dish rag he was he was very encouraging to me when i was not yet knighted he gave me some some good advice said that it's far easier for a gentleman who needs to learn fencing skills to become a knight than it is for a, an uncouth barbarian swordsman to become knighted and he meant those words by way of encouragement and i found them encouraging so i have that good memory of him yeah so i can add, I can add some up and comers i mean or the two of them right here. I mean, Duke Eli and, and Duke Dog both were up and comers, you know, um, during those those time periods of, of the late 70s and into the 80s. And um, so, again, so was Duke Komar, you know, and, and several other people that, you know, I, I, you know, I think we're all kind of sitting around thinking, well, 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 because a lot of them became knights. And a lot of them became counts and dukes that were up and coming during during our time periods. So the uh, in the seventies, you're you're going to practice and it's sparring. And uh, is there the focus? At what point does being an Easterner? Let me phrase it this way. Uh, I know that this era was the mid realm coming to Penzik and kicking the East's butt. Uh, so what was the focus around Penzik for y'all during this period? Was it something that you trained for? Is it uh, just something that happened? The first Penzik I went to was Penzik seven and I wasn't yet authorized. I first Penzik, Penzik I fought at was Penzik eight and then fought at Penzik nine. I wasn't at Penzik 10. But in between that and Penzik 11, I moved to, uh, I, was, I was in Michigan. Well, I had been moved already, but started training fighters and actually um, put together, we had some success doing a, a shield wall just out of random tourney shields and stuff based on some stuff I'd trained people to do. So between 11 and 12, we actually built war shields, we built, made tabards, we made, and I, I started developing drills for people um, for how to work together as a shield wall. And I was just making stuff up that seemed to work, but just based on my experience of having fought at Penzik for several years. And it seemed to work, we had, we had some success as a, as a group. I can't say that Penzik was for me anyway, a focus because I was still at that point working on my individual skills, but I was also teaching people. Um, Penzik as a folk didn't become a, say a, a strategic or a battle oriented focus for me until I won crown and I was going to be king and I was king at Penzik 13. At that point, I started studying, talking to people, studying, um, getting advice. Um, I actually talked to some, some 
people, military, actual military people. I read books and started developing some, some plans and some strategies with some success. Um, but I, I can tell you after that, the most I learned about strategy um, and battle melee strategy and large battle strategy was from Talamar, who is still remains, I think, the most brilliant strategist, battlefield strategist I've ever met in the SCA. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I first fought at Pensic 5, <clears throat> and at Pensic 5, uh, 6, and 7, uh, it was pretty much individual combat versus individual combat. Um, there wasn't a lot of group tactics. There didn't appear to be a lot of, of maneuvers. The first real maneuver that I can remember was uh, Moonwolf's field battle uh, that lasted three minutes um, because the, the, the command was when, the, when it lay on was, you know, sounded, you know, every other fighter was going to push through the line and then turn around and, uh, you know, come from the back. And you know the ones that were staying in front pushed, and it was over in like three minutes. That was the first real tactic that that I had ever seen. At Penzik nine, I was king, and I had 135 fighters, and I used um, three units to create three different wings. The Killer Elite was on one side. The Dark Horde was on another side, and Kalantir with the large shields that Eli was talking about formed the center because they promised me, we can hold, we can hold, and they did. And the other two wings were designed to sweep both sides. Um, and um, the one thing that I don't think we were particularly good at in tactics were um, woods battles. I think the, the East was always a little bit better in those, but field battles and bridge battles. Um, um, we won those pretty pretty handily. Um, so um, I, I think by then tactics were being developed. And like Eli says, as we moved, the East began to make tactics better. Um, Pensic 10 was, was Hugo's War, and I think it was the first one that we had lost. And that was primarily because the East had concentrated on unit tactics, um, fighting as units, not as individuals and um, had developed some really, you know, really good theories. And they had practiced, I think, all year long to, to fight at Penzig. And so uh, we, were, we were defeated at, at, at that time. And I think that, as Eli pointed out, really just began to change both sides in terms of, you know, development of tactics and such and the like. I think we'll talk a little bit more about Penzig when we, um jump into the 80s but to sort of finish up our conversation on the 70s i wanted to uh ask about the fighting orders and any of the fighting traditions that your kingdom has um did most of the fighting orders get created in the 70s or were there some that did later on much much the later fighting, yeah the, the, the only fighting order when i joined was the Gaping wound, which was is now a closed order. You got it for being hurt. Uh, so they decided that was a pretty stupid award to give out. You know, so it was it was stopped. The only other two was a dragon's heart for, or excuse me, a dragon's tooth for uh, ferocity in battle, not necessarily skill, ferocity in battle. And then there was nothing until you became a knight. There were there was no recognition of step by step with the exception of the unofficial um, status of squire. But most people okay. at that time looked at that as a fighting award, an unofficial award, a recognition of a step up. You're good enough to be a squire. You're better than the, you know, the newbies. I think there's one other thing in, in that um, <clears throat> following the abdication of Michael of Boardshaven, who was fairly new and won crown tournament, but didn't really understand it. It's a long story about him. Um, an invitational 
limited invitational list for crown tournament was instituted. Every kingdom has some method of controlling entry into crown tournament and the mid realms was invitational. So chivalry were guaranteed a spot and the unbelts were invited and a list of 32 names of unbelted fighters was published in the pale the kingdom newsletter in order because you would show up the, the at crown tournament and if a knight wanted to fight well the last person on the list of unbelts can't fight and if another knight shows up then the next person can't and until because it's it was always just 32 person double elimination and i remember traveling along so that was considered in a lot of ways the de facto here's who's going to be knighted list and me, being invited to crown tournament in those days was considered something of a fighting award a mid-level so fighting award when did that start the uh the 32 person list was that early in the um I think it was, it probably would have been just after Michael of Boershaven, um, who Zarina was queen, followed by, um, by, um, um, you mentioned his name. Um, they were followed by Albert. Albert, Albert von Dreckenfeld, um, who a very stylish man. I remember my first event going to and sit, he was sitting on a couch in in this hall surrounded by ladies and entertaining them with stories and i drew a picture of him because he was he was so stylish um followed by merowald and uh kirsten followed by moonwolf and <clears throat> so i think it was either albert or merowald created the 32 person invitational list i think but i'm, I'm not pretty sure it was albert I'm Albert, sure. okay. Um, I, would, I would like to interject here that if we're talking about significant fighting things that happened in the 70s, the, the culture that grew out of an invitational crown list, that, that single thing, can, it's hard to overestimate how important that has become to kingdom, middle kingdom culture. And, and it, shows, it showed when we stopped doing it for a while. And we're getting back to it. it. It it made a difference in how we treated our royalty, um, how the royalty treated or or um, took upon themselves the the responsibility of being the crown. Um, it it was it was central to mid realm culture. And the that, crown was deciding the prince. Um, was taking the responsibility for deciding and and getting advice from all the peerages about who was worthy to potentially reign and that did make a significant difference and i know when i had to develop an invitation a list uh, to invite people people who were skilled but were not going to be invited i talked to them personally and explained what the concerns people had were, and it affected their behavior. They, it, it made a difference. Some of them left, but most of them actually took the lessons to heart and became worthy of, of reigning. Uh, and some did after that. Um, I remember one tournament I was invited to, I, it was, it was a long drive and I drove there and I got there and I was number 32. I was an unbelt and I was the last person I made it into the list. So I could have driven all that way and not gotten to fight. And Talmar, I remember, published a list and said, everybody who's on this list is going to be allowed to fight. And it ended up being a 40 person tournament, I think. And the poor list table had no idea how to run an, a 40 person <laughs> list and had to figure it out that day. Um, yeah. 
just just as an aside, the reason that I did that was because I was one of those guys that was on a 32 man list in the first first night that signed up, you know, and actually I was the I was the cutoff point and I did not get to fight in Moon Wolf's first reign. And I didn't it didn't embitter me because it said to me, you're not good enough to make it to the regular, you know, can't get bumped off list. You're not good mm -hmm. enough. You know, and I think every night will tell you if there's an event that happens in their life that the switch is clicked on and the, and the world changes and you're on your way to knighthood. That was my click on moment. That was my click on moment. It was very good for me. The other thing I want to say about the 32 man list or the invitation was lots of people from other kingdoms said, you know, boy, that's got, you know, lots of potential for abuse. But, you know, in those early days we didn't abuse it. There were people that I put onto that list that I didn't personally like, but they would have been okay kings and they were good fighters. So that was kind of the tradition that we passed on royalty to royalty. You know, don't mess this up. Don't let your personal biases, you know, decide who can and cannot participate. If they will be an okay king, keep them on the list. And um, Doc's right. It was our culture for many, many years. Now that I that list, I'm grew. sorry. I really want to get us to the '80s, but this uh, this uh, okay. this uh, tradition of the way you're doing the the crown list is just super fascinating. So I, I have another question about it. Um, did you well, guys? It's did, actually a good did, segue. I don't. It, I want to. Open, but it'll spill into the '80s pretty easily okay. if you want to segue. So the crowns were they also factoring in consorts or just the fighter? Oi, 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 vey. Um, <clears throat> so there's a story. Um, uh, I did at one point um, have to tell someone that they could fight, but not for their consort Ouch. they should well, fight and we'd have to <laughs> fight for somebody else and i there were reasons for it and uh, i don't want to go into it here um but um well first had, first the first the answer though yeah. is, is no there was no consideration of who you fought for it was only the fighter at first and you had to yeah. announce the name of your consort after you won yeah, and I also am okay. involved in I'm involved in that too. Yeah, the kingdom law said you don't have to announce the name of your consort until you're done fighting. So <clears throat> crown tournament um, to choose my heir. Um, <clears throat> there's uh, it gets to the finals, and the woman who who is the consort of one of the finalists didn't think he would do that well and does not want to be queen and another person volunteers or is volunteered to and except to be the consort and people came to me and said because i was king and said can you can can they do this i said well the, the law says the person doesn't have to be announced the concert doesn't have to be announced till after the tournament so it's legal and I say, yes, you know, they should fight with a, you, nobody wants to win by default. So we'll do it. And he ended up winning actually. Um, um, and <clears throat> this, the net between then and my next reign, I put in kingdom law that you had to announce before the tournament, who your consort was so that their memberships could be checked. Okay, which is now standard procedure. <clears throat> um, and you couldn't change during the tournament, because the first time I got a lot of crap for letting somebody change. And then when I said you can't, then I got a lot of crap for that, too. So, you know, that's the nature of being king. So, yeah, in those days, you couldn't you didn't have you could didn't you wouldn't know who somebody was fighting for. It was only until I said I put in law that you had to announce that people even knew who somebody would be fighting for and could say this person is not acceptable as a consort. And um, I did have to do that once. And this was in the early 80s, like I said. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Well, so that can bring us then into uh, to that conversation <laughs> roundly then, and I'll cue the eighties music and we'll move on to that. So uh, crown fighters who, who made a uh, duchy during the eighties is a large list. So it's, I think it's three or four more people than, than who may have done it during the seventies. So we've got Laurel and, and moon wolf and Talamar and Alan. Uh, is that Elgil? Elgil? Alan Elgil. Alan Elgil. Uh, Poor and Salil. 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 Uh, some guy named Iliahu and Palomar, who we see much like dog through every generation <laughs> coming going forward from this period. So uh, every so often you'll turn around and see another crop of Palomar. Uh, and then uh, Tadashi, who won with a previous, with a different name in uh in the 70s and then with a second persona got his duchy if i'm understanding all that correctly correct so anyone yeah, out of this second persona. where do we want to start in this group uh, you know obviously we got someone uh on on the list it's on our panel uh well, two, I wanna, people, two people i want to mention something about because we talked about training mm -hmm. so at at this point I think in the in the 80s, there were starting to be, and it was started in the 70s, but really in the 80s, distinct regional styles. There was a Cleftlands style really started by Laurelin, who I learned a great deal from about fighting. And there was a Northwoods style. And the Cleftland style was a kind of li a linear style with a heater shield. Northwood style was um, a punch blocking with a dished round shield because, because they'd found a bunch of discarded or liberated, a bunch of um, uh, reflectors, uh, street lamp reflectors that were dished metal and developed this style. They referred to my heater shield as a cheater heater because it had corners. Um, <clears throat> and um, but I was studying, I was going to practice in Northwoods. I was going to practice with Cleflin's people. I was, I, I, I was going everywhere. I, I was practicing. I was going to multiple practice plus the local practice, multiple practices a week, um, Pell work, physical training, but uh, almost, it, almost every day of the week um, at this point. And so there were distinct, the development of distinct regional styles and i think what would happen is i would try something i learned one place against techniques in other places and try stuff i learned there and techniques in other places and so um as eliahu points out the regional styles there were by the end of the 80s i don't want to jump too far ahead but there was and and you can you can center these styles are pretty much around individuals who were who were hosting training regular training and were successful fighters themselves the cleflin style was sort of northern ohio central ohio was comar um the there was a indiana and illinois were dominated by moonwolf's style and his people and then north shield still being a part of the kingdom um the milwaukee area was the center and and their practice philosophies and styles and stuff spread from there throughout most of North Shield. So, and as, and as his grace pointed out there <clears throat> in the middle of the eighties is when I was knighted. And it was my personal belief that you had to recognize and be able to adapt to all of those different regional styles before you were a knight of the kingdom. You, you couldn't be, you know, a great guy in Indiana. And then you went to Ohio and got your butt handed to you. You had to, you had to be able to travel to those different regions and deal with their style. So. I'm going to drag us backwards for a bit because I totally screwed this up and forgot to ask my favorite question of this, which is looking back at the seventies for a minute. Uh, you have the Dukes of that era, Pariah Doc, Andrew, Doggin, Finbar, Finbar, and Marowald. So 
who won the 70s? What do, you, what do you mean by won the 70s? Who was the best out of those, that group? Or, what do you or, mean? or just of anybody, the Dukes, yeah. the non-Dukes, the, you know, but if there was one fighter that kind of dominated the, the, the decade or whose style, maybe it was their training, maybe it, some aspect of their overall prowess, whether it's their full-on fighting or, or again, it, you know, the influence they had as in any way, but it's just kind of a fun game and there's no wrong answer here, <laughs> but you know, who won the seventies? I'd have to say Duke Andrew. Elon? I think, I think given his influence with his squires and number of squires and training, um, uh, yeah, probably, uh, probably Andrew. Um, I, I never, got any i never saw any of his training uh for as in fighting um but he his influence he had an enormous influence in the number of of squires he took um so yeah and and he had another reign later on mm -hmm. as well so and and dog, I know you weren't necessarily super active in the seventies. Eighties is the beginning of your period, um, but you, you you maybe can operate from the mythology aspect of it. Who do you think won the seventies? Well, I, for me, the hero that I took out of the seventies was Moonwolf. Okay, just and it had to do with his his fighting style. Um, he was a two weapon fighter. I eventually became a two weapon fighter, but. He, his, Andrew was a very straightforward, he was bigger and stronger, and he could absorb more damage than anybody I knew. Moonwolf was, as I was, as I said to someone else, I was describing fighting, they didn't understand what fighting was or who fighting, who these fighting people were. And I said, these other guys are tough. You know, like Andrew's tough. Um, Laurelin's, Laurelin's skilled. Moonwolf was efficient. And the, this guy I'm describing went, ooh, and that's exactly that's exactly what it meant. It was he he didn't waste time. He didn't waste shots. He picked a target. He opened the target, and he hit the target, and that was it. Next. I, I I would have to agree in terms of, and I know I said to Andrew in terms of his influence, but Moonwolf, as I mentioned before, uh, I, my first the first event I went to was his first coronation, and other people were clubbing each other and moon wolf was elegant and smooth and as dog said efficient and it was uh, we used to judge ourselves as on belts by how long we could survive against moon wolf and and moon wolf was very gracious when when fighting people of lesser skill which was almost everybody mm -hmm. um in that he would give us time to he to try things and to do stuff before he'd kill us. And I remember the first time I actually hit him in the leg, and that and made my day. And then he killed me, but it was it was that was that was great. So I think Andrew had a big influence because of the number of squires, but Moonwolf certainly um, his demonstration of elegant elegant efficiency i think was maybe it was elegant because it was efficient but it, yeah i think significant he was significantly the best fighter of that era I would, well I, and that's a really a really good uh transition into this full-on discussion of the 80s now so thank you for that duke Talamar, you were you were saying i'm sorry to interrupt you i was just going to say I would throw Duke Laurelin into that late 70s into early 80s in mm -hmm. terms of who dominated it, in terms of uh, fighting style, in terms of personality and influence on the kingdom. And it's just kind of that, you know, that, that late 70s into that early 80s time period that I would throw that into. But Andrew dominated the, you know, the, the majority of the um, um, 70s. So as we're looking at the various fighters, uh, especially the standouts from the period, though, I, I, I have to ask about some of the outlying areas. So um, 
Did you guys actually interact with Kalantir much before they became a principality and a kingdom, or was it just suddenly they were a principality and then they were a kingdom? Yeah. I'm probably the first one to talk about that. I did a, I did a progress, um, 12 days progress through Kalantir. Mm -hmm. There was, it was an outlier. It, it didn't get much attention from the kingdom. They had developed a long ways their, away. It was. They had developed some of their own uh, ideas and their own traditions. And it started because I was in this far the southeastern corner of the kingdom. Nobody came to, to my group. I knew how that was. I knew how that felt. So I decided that I would be within four hours of every group in the kingdom. And that included mm -hmm. going to Mergen Wood in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and having a border raid with the West. Okay, so I took 12 days and I went through all those regions um, of Kalantir. And I held a court every night of the week of those 12 days. Heralds came back for years later and said, can't possibly be the right date because this is a Tuesday. Yep. <laughs> and I posted it all in the pale, so they were official events. Local group meetings that the king and queen went to and we got, rec you know, we got recommendations for awards. And I talked to people, found out what was going on, looked at their traditions. And um, it was the first time that there had been a lot of exposure in Kalantir to the crown. And it was the first time I think that the crown got a lot of information and came back and talked with Curia and said, it's time to start talking about principality for these folks. You know, it doesn't happen overnight. It's time to start thinking about that process. Um, we're, we're never gonna make them like the middle kingdom. They've already got a tradition of their own. Um, so um, that was yeah. now, North Shield was getting a, a, enough, I think, attention. Um, you know, especially in Madison and uh, um, even all the way up into Minneapolis. Um, we were traveling to the first crown tournament that I ever went to was in Minneapolis. Right. Um, but Kalantir, with the exception of St. Louis, um, which was Three Rivers, it was not getting a lot of attention just simply because of the distances. What about Eldermere? When do, do we remember much about when it started and if it was getting a lot of attention? So I, I can shed some light on both um, Kalantir and Eldermere. Kalantir um, <clears throat> actually held their first crown tournament coronation when I was prince. Um, and um, <clears throat> uh, there were, there were, it did not, go well the separation did not go well there were some personality conflicts between some people in calendar calendar and some people in the middle there the some people in calendar were disgruntled because nobody in the middle traveled there well they bordered on illinois and nobody in illinois traveled anywhere even to the rest of the middle so it wasn't a, meant as a slight it was just it was distance and and who was there but um, so as Prince, uh, I, I really wanted to go to witness this crown tour, first crown tournament coronation and chose not to because I knew that as king, I would have to start repairing relations with Kalantir, which I, so I stayed away so that, because if I went, I'd have to, uh, it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have worked out. So uh, well, I wouldn't have been able to do that. So I did that. Um, <clears throat> and there were similar, and it did, it worked out. They were um, uh, the, uh, allied with us is in, at, um, um, and it, 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 it worked out well with Count here. Eldermere was, had a similar, problems, although people went there, particularly people from Michigan would go into um, Eldermere and enjoyed it there, but there were similar personality conflicts with, oh, some of the same different people, 
between Calantara and and Eldermere, Maybe but some the of the middle. same people in the middle <laughs> um, who were having personality conflicts and differences of thought about how things should should go. And so a lot of us did did some work to re try to repair that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Eldermere went kingdom during Dog's, one of Dog's reigns, I think. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was involved with, um, we can involved about, by not being involved in some ways with both. We can talk about the secession in the 90s. Yeah, exactly. So. Well, all right, then. Let's, let's stay on the uh, fighting aspect then. Um, there was a fairly healthy discussion going on in the uh, Facebook chat about shield sizes during the period. Uh, when when shield size sizes were first sort of uh, mandated by by law or rule, and when they may have changed. Uh, and since I'm not super familiar with uh, any of that, someone who might be, jump in here and enlighten us. What's going on with shield sizes during uh, the 70s and 80s? Well, since my my first crowns were fought in the 80s, there was a there was a 26 inch shield rule for crown tournament only. okay there was no blanket rule about fighting with a any size particular shield but crown tournament had a size limit and i don't know tell me may, may, the 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 incident that caused the limit as always was an there's an incident right every law is written <laughs> about an incident um but by the time i was fighting in crown tournaments well you couldn't fight with a bigger 26 shield why practice with anything else so it just spread throughout sort of kingdom culture. Um, but the, it was a crown rule, not a kingdom rule, so to speak. But I don't okay. know. Talmar, do you remember the, the tournament, the, the crown I, that happened? I, I, the, the first crown that I had to worry about it in was, was Finvar's crown up in Minneapolis. And he looked at every shield and said, yes or no. But there was nothing. Almost all of us were fighting with round shields. Eh, you know. I don't remember that there was a specific dimension, but I do remember that Laurelin made a specific dimension, particularly for heaters, and it was measured on a diagonal from the center of one side to the corner of another. Um, and then we also developed some that were from chin to crotch and things like that. But I think Laurelin might have been the first one that put out a specific uh, inch um, size and um, I think it did it for heaters and for round shields. And, you know, dog's right. It, you know, didn't make any difference what you fought with the rest of the year. But if you wanted to fight in crown, you had to fight with one that was, you know, in, in this dimensional size. And, and as always, acceptable to the crown. I think that's correct with, uh, as I remember it, too. And I remember it fluctuating a bit over several years where it, you know, it could be a little longer, it could be a little shorter. Uh, had to be a little shorter and then eventually went to more of a body dimension you hold the hold it under your arm stand over it chin the crotch whatever and eventually i think that went away to the you know don't be a jerk about it and bring out a war shield was is sort of how it ended up but there turned out to be um a an efficiency in that derives from using a shield that's neither too small nor too large, but one that, as as Dog has put it before, of head, body, and leg only covers two of the three at any time. And um, there's, there, I, in fact, the system I have where that I teach people how to make a uh, an effective uh, tournament heater shield for their body is based on their body, not on arbitrary measurements, but there were arbitrary measurements. And I think- I, that I, I can Duke, say with some, count, go ahead, Talmer. I was just gonna say, I think that maybe Duke Edmund was one of the first ones to kind of change that to maybe a chin, the, the crotch, because you know Edmund is like 6'3", somewhere in through there. And those six small nine. shields- 6'9". It's six nine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some of those small shields really, you know, you know, were a disadvantage to him. So I think he was one of those that, you know, kind of changed it around maybe from 
chin to crotch or at least to you know something that was appropriate uh, uh, away from the strict dimensions and, and alanon's grinning over there i can see him but the, <laughs> <laughs> see and this is not this this is my personal thing and and maybe not fitting for here but i think that that the and i have i can say with absolute confidence that i've overseen more crown tournaments in this kingdom than anybody else over over longer period than anybody else so and I've, I've used got lots of different methods for determining what's an appropriate shield for crown tournament. But the argument that, oh, I'm, I'm so tall, I should get a bigger, she bigger shield. Well, yeah, but by the same token, your arms are eight inches longer than mine. You should have to use a shorter sword. How about that? And uh, that never seems to go over so well. <laughs> and it's, I think it's a trade-off. I think if everybody was using a, a similar dimension, you know, you for for equipment and okay you may get the advantage that god gave you but that's all you don't get your reach plus a four inch longer sword and you know so the personal philosophy i i uh, think that the 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 <clears throat> this is diverting from the subject yes. but it's related there I did see having having overseen rewrites of Kingdom Law several times and seeing making certain that there were guiding there to be a change from laws that were very specifically named at, directed at individuals to principles. And the same way that we've seen regulations or like rules of the list or, or kingdom specific rules change from no no greater than a 90 degree swing to no excessive force a principle rather than a measurable rule and i th i think that's a and it i think that's better to to do it that way is is this a principle that's being upheld and um but the, the same way that you know no laws of attainder against specific individuals so anyway but, but the problem with the the sort of proportional shield or the crown just you have to apply to the crown on the day to determine whether your shield is appropriate puts the onus on the crown yeah to having to decide well it, that one that shield's okay for you but the same shield wouldn't be okay for him and that's i think that is a problem that that can be set set aside if you are if you have a rule about it that's that everybody can just follow so on one so hand it seems it seems ridiculous to me uh, you know certainly a foreigner to the mid realm uh that you would need to have a specific shield size but on the other hand i've absolutely seen where it made the fighting culture really good from us from its individual prowess because you have to both you have to both manage defense and offense and you can't just let something be a static dead dumb arm you know you actually have to work it so you have to work your range and so you have to work your pacing and you have to work all the aspects of fighting together you know when you can be hit and while i don't like a rule i absolutely personally think that people there's too big a shield and you know, and and it will absolutely hurt you as a, from a standpoint of your overall prowess. Um, Certain, certainly, every kingdom has had either rules or traditions or both that have affected their fighting styles and and prowess. And the oh, it's it's unchivalrous to hit somebody in the arm rule that i used to see i remember fighting somebody and i who who was had their sword hanging down from their shield like this and i just went up trapped their sword and started tapping them in the arm and uh, because nobody ever did that it was it was considered invulnerable it was un unchivalry well if if you make a rule you or even or a tradition to not hit something then that can be used it, it'll rules and traditions can move the fighting culture or the fighting style the fighting ability the prowess in a specific direction um <clears throat> that isn't necessarily to the betterment of the fighting art 
And I, I think, and Telmar, maybe that's why I asked Telmar earlier, it seems to me, I was told that the 26 inch rule came about from a tournament where two fighters had lost their legs and they were fighting with larger than what was considered normal at the time shields and neither one could hit each other. They, their mm -hmm. legs were already gone. They just sat behind their shields and threw shots and nothing happened. It was like a half hour fight or something ridiculous. And so that rule got some kind of rule got put in that said, okay, we're not using these big shields for crown. Um, but I, that was before my time. The rule was already in when I started fighting. It was before my time too. I heard the story, the same story though. I don't think I was present at that event, but yes, I think that's what, you know, again, I heard, yeah, okay. You know, we've got to make it so that there's a real skill here, not just hiding behind a, a barn door. So your, your point is, is demonstrated, Alan, on right there. So thinking about, we talked, we touched on this a little bit earlier. Uh, I was hoping we could circle back to some of the awards and traditions that arose in the 80s, other than shield size. Um, <laughs> uh what were uh what came up around fighting culture in the 80s that are isn't just an award or or is an award can anybody remember any examples of that oh, I'll, like I'll, red I'll, company when did that guy start 90s yeah 90s okay gold mace same thing yeah later <laughs> gold mace came after the original red company gold mace is like a a uh a step above red company mm -hmm. so it, most level. of the candidates for gold mace come out of the red company so really you still just have dragon's tooth through this period yep yep eventually dragon's teeth for a group effort okay as well which speaks to our our reorienting a little bit more towards penzik and that's that is that kind of a because the East really started to win some and, and become competitive and they got really focused, perhaps even hyper-focused on Penzik uh, that during this period, you guys just sort of also started working on, you know, focusing on Penzik. Yeah. In my view, we, we have not, are still not as focused as the East is on Penzik. Um, we don't, Others may argue with me, but but my take on the our culture is that we don't care as much who wins and loses. We want to do well. We want to show off, and we want to you know it's great to win. But we're pretty philosophical about eh. Okay, well we we did our thing and we we executed our our uh, orders well, and they won. Okay, is there beer cold? Because you know, that, that's really the more important question at the end of the day then who won? Is, is there enough beer to go around? So <laughs> and that's kind of been our philosophy forever. We happened to win early with that same philosophy. And I think Talmer pointed out that his, originally it was just a bunch of individual fights. It was very more, it's funny, if you look back, the SCA evolution of warfare is very much the historical evolution of warfare. You know, heroic fighters going out and challenging and doing individual combats and you fight the guy across from you and if one, one of you dies and then you look for the next guy. And that was how wars started. And then it was small groups sort of getting together and, and very primitive sort of strategies until now we have armies with, you know, command structures and um plans that are you know a year in the making and stuff and it's it, it's interesting I, I ultimately see, pointless for me but uh, i was going to say i see three major cultural changes that predominantly happened during the 80s one was early on it was a tournament was a double eliminated a double elimination tournament that was it and there was nothing else going on everybody sat and watched and, and, you know, people had their favorites and they watched their favorites throughout the tournament. Um, and the, the tournament was the center of the event. Um, the disadvantage to that was, you know, I drove for 10 hours, I got two fights in and I'm out. <laughs> so we moved to bear pits and things like that where there was constant fighting, but we lost the audience because who are they fighting? 
How many times have they won? How many times they lost? You don't see any kind of a progression. We also have lost in the middle, at least, the idea of I've been killed, I fall down. People don't fall down anymore. You know, that yes, they, you know, they nod their head, you know, maybe say dead, shake hands with their opponent and walk off. But the audience sometimes has to say, who won? Who won? Sometimes even the marshals have to say, who, who just won? The other thing that we have lost, in my opinion, is the idea of points of honor, which again, were a big thing in the 70s and began to change through the 80s. Um, most of the people in the middle kingdom, in my generation at least, thought that giving a point of honor was like evening up the fight. We're having too much fun. I took your leg. I'll take my leg and we'll just keep going. You know, can you, know, can you share with the audience ex what, what that what a point of honor means? Yeah, a point of honor means that if I take your leg, then I go down myself on mine. I even up the fight. If I take your arm, then I put, you know, my shield maybe behind my back. Mm -hmm. um, we even up the fight. My, and, my knight was a big proponent of that to the debt to the his detriment to, you know, losing tournaments because of it. And and, um, you know. It's a very romantic, and and that's I think it's why he got into the SCA to begin with for the romance, the beauty, the magic of the SCA, and so it was nothing to him to lose his arm or his his leg uh, to even the fight as best he could because that meant more to him and that felt more magical to him than sort of the way I treat it, which is very sport oriented, and I took that leg on purpose. <laughs> yeah, and I, you're absolutely right. I think it had to do with the romance that we had of those early days and the, the fact that you're a worthy opponent and let's just you know have fun. But then it, it crept in from outside the kingdom, I believe. Well, you think you're so good, it became a, an insult. You think you're that much better than me that you can lose your leg and still kill me? Boy, mm -hmm. what an ass you are. <laughs> That slowly crept in and people, well, geez, I didn't mean it that way. So maybe I shouldn't do that. You know, and more of the sports aspect came in. Yeah, I worked hard and I got that. And I'm going to, you know. Well, I think there's another, another aspect of it is that as we learned skills and trained in a more focused fashion, what are we training for if you're not trying to gain some advantage in a fight? Um, and I, I, I understand what you're saying. Talmar, that there's a that the, there's a sort of a synergy between those two things that it's more sport oriented you know and as it became more competitive is where we we started training in a more focused fashion winning the fight is the obvious goal and why why train if you're going to give up the advantage that you just took you know whereas before it was a <laughs> clubbing each other on top of the head and whoever got the one first Okay, well, you win, but there wasn't a big feeling of loss because you hadn't spent all of this time focusing on this aspect or that aspect or doing drills or, you know, it, it, winning and losing wasn't that important. It was the experience of the fight. And as that went, as that shifted towards, you know, I can practice this way and get better. Winning the fight becomes more important than just showing well. Um, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of aspects to it. And the, certainly the, the fact, the, the aspect of, oh, you think you're so much better than me, then, then you can go on and beat me with one hand tied behind your back. Yeah, that's, that's certainly a part of it. Um, and but one thing that has bothered me lately, but more, I hear it more in crown tournaments is you take someone's arm and then you have to sort of loudly announce that since I respect you so much, I'm going to keep my advantage and then proceed to beat the guy. Well, what was the point of that? Really? What sort of false humility are you trying to display there? That's, that's that to me, that is the, the outgrowth of that, that sort of looking at it as a condescension. Mm -hmm. So as we come to time, this has been a wonderful conversation that I really enjoyed. Um, I want to think about the eighties as a decade and ask my favorite question again of who won the eighties. 
Looking back at uh, the Dukes of the era, we have Laurelin, Moonwolf, Talamar, Corin, Eliyahu, and Palomar. Any other names that you want to throw in there as uh, winning the decade? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, Palomar? I think the 80s was such a time of change to say that one person dominated the whole 80s. I don't think we can say that because I, I'm going to repeat what I said earlier. I think during the early 80s, it was Lorland and yeah. fighting style, personality, uh, influence, all those things. But as it progressed, you know, other of those Dukes that you, you have on the list um, also became a, a, a huge impact. So I, I can't say that there was one that dominated that entire 10 years, but I'll throw my 10 two cents worth in for the beginning of the eighties. Yeah, I would say that, that I would agree that Laurelin's influence from the seventies bled well into the eighties. Um, but I would, but I'll, I'll go back to my sort of renown on the field was, was all Moonwolf in the mid eighties. And I think he gave it up a little bit to Palomar by the end of the eighties. Palomar was, was, was rising was cresting in his in that in that decade um i i laurelin had a huge influence it was one of my teachers that really affected my fighting um <clears throat> and uh um yeah it's it's there were i agree with talamar there were so many um people there was such an interesting time and so much going on um i will say though i entered crown tournament twice in the 80s and won both time but just saying you know <laughs> I, in all humility right <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think there's any rule about voting for yourself <laughs> <laughs> each person on that list dominated the 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 crown lists the um uh the laws, the personality, everything of that time period. That's why it's difficult to say one person. I think each one of those people, you know, had their own sense of dominance through, you know, their, their, their time period. I think that's a great answer. I, I think we're shortchanging the 80s some because we really got lost in the weeds of the 70s um, and the, the beginning history. Uh, and I, and I, I regret that, but this has been an amazing discussion and I'm so, so appreciative uh, for his grace dog and his grace Eliyahu and his grace Talamar for being able to join us this evening. Uh, I know Brennan and I both are just absolute geeks on, you know, other kingdoms, history and culture. And we love, we love heroes, our own personal heroes so much to hear other people talk about theirs is is a pleasure and a privilege that uh you know i just really feel blessed to be able to sit here this evening with you guys and and to talk about uh this subject um uh, this is, i've enjoyed this very much and uh sometime we'll get together and tell you the stories that we're not talking about here um, <laughs> and that will be interesting well, yeah, I, I, think, I still feel... think we should charge a mission for that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's certainly going to be a vetting process. <laughs> I, I appreciate the fact that, you know, I, I was invited to this. I don't think of myself as, as a hero, but <laughs> we, I, my heroes are those folks that went before me, you know, mm -hmm. people you grow up mm -hmm. with. And that changes, you know, with every generation uh, of, of uh, people and at some point in time the people that were my heroes are forgotten about by the new fighters you know um and you know we are beginning to be you know well yeah i've heard the name you know uh, okay but i don't know them personally that that always slides in a culture who the heroes and the legends are um we have a short memory in the sca and in some ways um we lose our we lose our history um but um, like I say, I, I think my heroes, like a lot of the things that Eli and Dog have talked about, were the people that came before us. 
you know, we. This is absolutely our way of trying to not forget people and to not forget those giants whose shoulders we walk on. I really regret that we're out of time. So uh, for Brennan and myself and for all of our guests, thank you very much. Next week's episode is my first kit and the best way to get there. And we've got uh, some of the normal uh, coaches who are going to help us get through that. But thank you very much, everyone. And uh, thanks to our producer, Sir Tiedward. Um, This has been a great time. Very Thank you, everyone. Thanks, y'all. Thanks for Thank you. Us. And it's ending. <laughs>